I don't need that. All right, good morning, y'all. Everybody, everybody got their breakfast ready to roll? Got your coffee? Good. All right, I'm going to remind y'all that we got, through a generous donation here, we've got these free t-shirts, and they're all on the back table over there. They are, there's pink, red, and blue now. I think the green has run out. But free shirts, these shirts are free, so free to take one. And I think they range in size from small to 3X. So back table, free. Here you go. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14 is where we're at. Talking about the death of John the Baptist. And uh, how to make some bad decisions. Matthew chapter 14, so this, this little uh, episode here is a memory of Herod's, because when Jesus Christ starts to become more famous, so to speak, his fame spreads abroad, um, Herod thinks it is John the Baptist resurrected from the dead because Herod remembers the, uh, the episode where he killed John the Baptist, and this is, this is the memory of it. Matthew chapter 14, verse 3, let's read, and we'll read through verse, uh, verse 12 here. It says, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It's not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head and charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger, and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Uh, look over in Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read, because there's some more details there, and then we'll come back to Matthew. But just to give you... A couple more details in this. Mark chapter 6, verse 17. Mark 6, 17 says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So Herod, kind of, a, you see a little more details here with Herod's interest in John the Baptist, but got a problem with his, his uh, not his wife, his girlfriend, I guess. And when a convenient day, verse 21, was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half of my kingdoms. I'll, I'll make you equal in my kingdom. That's a, that's a, that's a dumb, dumb oath there. That's a, that's a, that, yeah, that is a Drunken man there. Um, verse 24, And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. 
Immediately the king sent an executioner, commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. All right, back over to Matthew, and we're going to dig apart this death of John the Baptist and see some... Uh, it, it's just a, it's a terrible decision that's made here. And, and there's some things that went into this decision to kill John the Baptist. But I, th- I think it's, it is pretty, pretty peculiar, pretty uh, wild when you find out some of, the, some of the basis for life-changing decisions in your lives and, and, and the lives of other people. I mean, literally, John the Baptist is beheaded because Herod's girlfriend is mad. I mean, that, that is, that's the reason John the Baptist is beheaded. All right, let's pray, and we'll talk about this stuff. Father, I pray that you would you'd help us with these verses. Um, I pray that you would help us make the applications that need to be made in our lives. Uh, I pray that you would... Um, Guide the, the teachers in the back as they teach the, the kids. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for uh, our visitors and guests. Thank you for those that have come a long way to get here. And thank you for giving them safety. And I pray that each soul here would be blessed for being here. And then for those that are watching online, Lord, that you'd bless them as well. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple things about Herod. There, there's a few Herods in the Bible, <clears throat> and this is not the Herod of the the Herod that killed the children in Bethlehem. That's his dad. Uh, this is the son of that Herod. It, it, it is, however, the Herod that when Pilate um, is, is trying Jesus Christ, Pilate sends Jesus Christ to Herod, and Herod's kind of interested in seeing what Jesus can do, and so he wants to see a miracle, and when Jesus doesn't talk to him or perform any miracles, Herod just sends him away. He's kind of like, you know, interested in the entertainment, want to see some sign, want to see maybe water turned to wine or something, and when Jesus doesn't perform any miracles in front of Herod, he just, he's like, I don't don't know why you sent me this guy, just send him back over there. Uh, This is the Herod that Jesus Christ called a fox, he says, go tell that fox, that I do many miracles, and on the third day I'll be uh, resurrected, something like that. And this is also the Herod. It looks like it looks like it's the same Herod that uh, kills James in Acts chapter twelve. I don't I don't know for sure, but I don't know of any. There's no distinction when there is a distinction when Luke writes in Acts about Herod Agrippa. He calls him Agrippa. When there's, there's uh, Herod the Great, he calls him Herod the Great. And when he calls Herod, Herod in Acts chapter 12, he just calls him Herod. And it looks like the same guy that has James killed. And then in the middle of a speech at, at the end of Acts 12, he just gets eaten by worms, which is an interesting thing. But, uh, so this, this, I think it's the same Herod as in, in Acts there, but it's also definitely the Herod that bounces Jesus Christ back and forth between Pilate. And the Bible says uh, that Herod and Pilate became friends because of the whole trial with Jesus Christ. So this is that Herod. He is, he's just a political guy. I mean, he's a, he's a political guy. His family's political. They've been in politics. And so uh, he has some influence. And when John's preaching finally reaches, I guess, the palace... And uh, John has some specific things to say about Herod and his latest wife, I guess, his girlfriend. And uh, he says, y- y'all's relationship is not, it's not lawful. You can't do that. It's, that's called adultery. And this, this relationship you've created is just called adultery is what it's called. Well, Herodias doesn't like that. And, and the first point I, I want you to notice in, in all of this, back in Matthew chapter 14 is it is one thing, it's one thing for you and I to say we're sinners. I think we would say that in general. You know what, I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm just, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a low-down, dirty sinner and all that kind of stuff and whatever. It's, it's one thing to say sin 
in general. But when, when the sin becomes your sin and personal, well, that's a different thing. That's, that's a different thing. Look over in Matthew 14, what we just read, verses 3 and 4. It says, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake. So he's arrested and put in prison just because of his preaching. That's the only reason he's in prison. He hasn't broken any laws. He's only in prison because of what he said about Herod and Herodias. And more specifically, he's only in prison because of Herodias. She's the one that, that drove this thing. For Herod had laid hold on, on John and bound him in, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It's not lawful for thee to have her. So that was the problem. Personal conviction. And again, it, it, it is one thing to preach on sin. We could just say, yeah, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. Yeah, God saved me from sin and all that stuff. But when you start talking about personal sin, and you start talking about your sin and my sin, well, that's a different story. We kind of we, we want to cover that thing up and, and justify that thing and protect that thing and all that stuff, particularly particularly when it comes to relationships. I mean, p- people are so protective about their relationships. Be- I mean, and relationships are very important. I mean, they're, they're, they're very important. God made relationships, and they're, they're extremely valuable to people, and they stir up a lot of emotions. And so when John says, it's unlawful what you and Herodias are doing, this is just called adultery according to God, this isn't a marriage. Nobody, you may have had a judge or a justice of the peace sign a, sign a marriage license or something, but this isn't a marriage. This is just adultery, according to God. Well, Herodias doesn't, doesn't like that. And so she gets on Herod about getting John and has John arrested. And, uh, uh, of course, he's, he's sitting there in prison and... <laughs> Herodias wants, wants John dead because, uh, can you imagine this? This is how far this goes. This is how far the, the human emotions can go. When someone is convicted of their sin, this is how far human emotions go. I mean, they will, they, they will drive people to murder. I mean, they will drive people to kill. They will drive people to steal. They will drive people to, I guess, murder is the, the highest, the, the worst case, but... Uh, uh, this is how far human emotion goes. Yeah, people get stirred up. And I'm, I'll show you some more things about human emotion. But I don't want you to think that, uh, uh, I mean, God created emotions. God has emotions. He has anger. He has joy. He has, he has emotions. But emotions outside of their proper context are destructive. Emotions within the right context are good, but emotions outside of the right context are, ter- are terrible. They can be. And that's, that's the way sin is. Relationships are good, but relationships outside of God's parameters for relationships are very destructive. So here's, here's personal conviction here. Herodias is personally convicted of her sin, not just sin in general, her sin. And she wants to get back at John, and she has the power to do it. And so she has John thrown in prison through Herod, and uh, she wants him dead. But Herod's kind of a, it, you know, that's not the political thing to do because the people still kind of think John's, John's a prophet. So it's not politically expedient to have John killed yet, but having him arrested, that's, that's, that's another story. So, so he gets him arrested, and... Uh, uh, speaking of speaking of personal convictions and personal sin, and you know, if preaching doesn't address personal sin, really, really, what what are we doing? I mean, Jesus Christ came to take away sin, and I know that's not the whole thing about preaching. You need to be encouraged. You need to have comfort. You have a whole lot of other things. But also, if you're not personally convicted of sin, meaning you say, I got saved, Jesus saved me from my sins, but you don't know what sin he saved you from, then how are you saved from sin if you don't have any sin that you can identify? 
I mean, just call it by name. This is what it is. This, this is called adultery. This is called fornication. This is called theft. This is called whatever. Give it a name. It's a, it has a name. So uh, that, be, that being said, um, I saw in the, in the Babylon Bee about preaching, and, and it said this. It was, it was a funny little headline. If y'all, if y'all don't know, Babylon Bee is like a satire thing, all right? It said this. It said, woman unsure why she needs Jesus after preacher spends 30 minutes telling her how amazing she is. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's about where you're at. If we're all so amazing, what do we need Jesus Christ for? So going back to the conviction thing, the point is you, you identify sin, all right? Then it, here's Herod's deal now. Let's look in verse, uh, verse 5. Herod has this paralyzing cowardice. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. When we read over in Mark, Herod was not only afraid of the public, he was also afraid of John. He was also afraid of the people at the party. He, he was just afraid of everybody but God. He's afraid of everybody but God. The, the one that he should be afraid of. So Herod's fear is just, it's a paralyzing fear. Look over in Proverbs. You've probably heard this verse before. But no truer words were said about this situation with Herod here. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Proverbs 29, 25. When it comes to the fear of man, Herod's afraid of the people. Herod's afraid of his, his girlfriend. Herod's afraid of John the Baptist. Herod's afraid of his conscience. But Herod's not afraid of God. And that's who he should be afraid of, but he's not. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. No truer words were said of the case you're reading right now with Herod. The fear of man bringeth a snare. That's... I mean, that's all, that's all needs to be said there. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So Herod is in this fear, and in anyone's fear, you, you're afraid of, of the people, you're afraid of uh, what Herod's afraid of, Herod's afraid of his girlfriend, the people, Herod's afraid of John, Herod's afraid of everybody but the Lord. And in doing so, he just is, is slowly spreading a net around his feet. I mean, just slowly weaving this web that will eventually get him, get him caught in a, in a sin that he's not going to get out of. So he has this paralyzing cowardice. Just, just you know, he's stuck. He, he's got John arrested only for preaching. That's the only reason he's arrested. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to, before we move on, I'm going to introduce a little, a little thought here. Because I try to, I don't know, think of things in... Modern terms, um, what's going on here? People haven't, haven't changed, really. And so I imagine when John gets arrested, uh, it, it may be he, 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 his arrest warrant is preaching, but I doubt it. I, I, it's probably he's a public nuisance or something. Or there's, there's some cause here that the state is going to justify arresting John for. Because if the people believe he's a prophet... The people don't really want him arrested, but the state wants him arrested, so they're going to have to come up with a justifiable reason to arrest him. And, you, I mean, you know how this stuff plays out in the media. There has to be a reason. You just can't walk into people's homes and take them out for no reason unless there's some media story that goes with how, what a terrible person this is and all this kind of stuff. So I imagine they, they put out some 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 news articles about what, how, what John's been doing in secret or something like that. And so John's kind of, you know, they, they, they just make him sort of a, sort of a not, as, not as holy character as in the public's eye, just, just to justify, if you understand what I'm saying. Because, because when, when he kills John, you can imagine what kind of articles are going to have to be published there. Someone's going to have to justify why this guy got killed. So we'll get to that in a second. So... Back to Herod. I just want to throw that out there because you know people haven't changed. And you know 
the way decisions are made and covered up, it's the way they've always been made and covered up. So uh, Herod fears John, he fears his wife or girlfriend, Herod fears the people, he has John arrested on whatever charge, I don't know what charge he has him arrested on, and then he makes a promise. So there's a, there's a birthday party, let's read verse, uh, verse 6. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before him and pleased him, or pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given. So, <laughs> this is a, a, an example of some really foolish obligations. Here, here's a party. Uh, I don't, know if the, I don't know if the dance was inappropriate. I don't know. I've heard people preach on the dance being inappropriate. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But the point is, Herod's probably drunk, and people are dancing, and she's dancing, and she sounds like she's just a little girl. I mean, she, she's asking her mom what to do in this situation. And so she's, she's dancing, and people are drinking, and Herod just stupidly says, well, that was such a great dance, so you can just have anything you want around here. And, I mean, you can imagine how that goes, you know, stupid things being said at a party and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, he throws that out there, and he throws that out there in front of everybody. Oh, this is, this is you're doing such a great job. You just t- pick what you want in the kingdom, and it's yours. And so the, the little girl, Herodias' daughter... <laughs> well, she and she asked her mom. She asked her mom, "What do I do in this situation?" And her mom is instructing her, "You, you get John the Baptist's head." And uh, so, older, younger, teenager, young, whatever. The point is, Herod obligates himself foolishly. He makes a stupid statement and puts himself out there. And it's a careless promise. And if, there, if there's anything, I'd say anything the devil wants out of your life and my life, it, it is to obligate you foolishly to things and basically tie you to a sinking ship in your life. Just get you hooked up with a sinking ship. And so here's, he's made this, this promise. And now, now all these people have seen it. They've all been at the party. They've heard what he said. And here comes the daughter. And uh, she says, I want uh, John, John Baptist's head in a, in a charger. And, I, and Herod is, <laughs> I, mean, I imagine he's thinking, okay. That, that probably sobered him up a little bit. You know, <laughs> like, oh gosh, what are we doing now? And uh, now he's got to figure out, how do I get John killed Satisfy the public, and I mean, this is just this is just a total total disaster now, total disaster. But uh, to learn from it, to learn from it, there are some people that have made some some really dumb oaths in the Bible. Uh, Jephthah was a pretty incredible man. I don't know if you remember the story of Jephthah, but uh, go back look at the Judges. He makes an oath about. Uh, if he wins the battle, then the first thing that walks out of the door, he'll sacrifice. And the first thing that walks out of the door is his daughter. And, I mean, you didn't even have to make the oath. You didn't have to say that. You did not have to do that. But you went and, you went and tied yourself to this thing, and now you're, now you're stuck. So here's Herod. He, he, he makes this foolish obligation. And I, I don't think the devil wants anything, anything better than to tie you like I said, to a sinking ship. So here, here's what happens with, with uh, service to God, for instance. We've talked about it before. But maybe you're overextended in some area, and the Lord wants you to, I, I don't know, with your time, with your money, with your talent, He wants you to serve Him more in an area. But you say, I can't do that because I've got this. 
And the point is, you're overextended and you're tied to this thing and you're stuck. And so now you've got to figure out how do I get untangled from this thing and actually serve God with my life because I'm not even in a position to serve God now. I'm so tied down by these other things that I can't serve God if I want to serve God. So uh, Proverbs says a lot about this unwise obligations. And so here's Herod. He makes this oath. And Herodias uses her daughter to take him up on the oath. And it's not going to be good. So let's read verse 10. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison (laughs) after this. So this man's life has literally ended at 31 years, maybe. 31 years old. His life has literally ended because the person in power has the power to end his life. And the person in power is just, just fearful of everybody, and his girlfriend wants, him, wants John the Baptist dead. So literally, John the Baptist's life ends because Herodias wants it to end. You talk, you talk about injustice. This is the type of injustice that when Jesus Christ returns, this stuff in politics, it, it's, it's gone. This corruption, this nonsense about righteous people being thrown in prison, this is, this is gone. And so... John, is, he's a just man, he's a good man, and Jesus Christ's record of John, is that this is among men born of women. He says over, earlier in Matthew, he says, this is the best man that ever lived. This man is the best man that ever lived, which we've talked about before. I mean, if, if that was God's estimation of John the Baptist, I, I imagine... <laughs> Our estimation is a little bit different, and if we saw John the Baptist, we would think he's kind of a, kind of a scary, scary figure and kind of a weird guy, but the Lord's estimation of him is, this is the best man that ever lived, and he dies at 31 years old, his head chopped off because of some angry woman in politics. I mean, really, this is, this is how bad this thing gets. So here's what happens, verse 10, he sent and beheaded John in the prison. There is, there is this, as, as we said here, um, well, let me just direct you to a place. Look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It'll explain this. Ephesians four twenty six. Giving place to the devil. Ephesians 4.26. Here's what Paul says. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. So you, and, and Paul's talking to Christian people. I mean, this is to a church. And he says... If you don't get a hold of your emotional life, you literally give the devil an opportunity to ruin your life. So here's Herodias. She, she is, she is not, not angry and, and sinning not. She is in full sin mode. I mean, she is, she is angry. She's day and night sleeping and, 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 and waking up angry at John and just wants John dead. And so she has fully, fully given the devil control of her thought life, her emotional life, her, her, her probably physical health. I imagine that stuff takes a physical toll on you to be bitter and angry that, that much. And so uh, this uncontrolled emotions, Proverbs, he says it this way. He says, he, says, he that ruleth not his spirit is like a, a, the wall of a city that's broken down, which means the enemy just comes and goes at will. There's no defense. And, and someone who won't control their emotions, they're just, the enemy's just in and out at will, however he wants to be. And so here's, here's the way Paul said it. He just, you just give place to the devil. You give him some real estate, and he'll take it. And so uncontrolled emotions, I'll just give you a few thoughts on these things. Uh, ultimately, in John's case, it leads to his death because of her. 
Uh, ultimately, in John's case, it leads to his death because Herod won't control his fear. Um, but uncontrolled emotions, they'll bring ruin. Uh, uncontrolled emotions become sin. Uh, uncontrolled emotions become idols. They become idols. Think about it. You get, well, let's take the relationship here, for example. Herodias will do anything she can to protect this relationship. This thing, this thing is an idol. She will defend it. She will defend it to the death. She, 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 will, she will make another person look like a criminal. Whoever says anything bad about her relationship, she will make that person look like a criminal if she can. This, this, this whole relationship and this, this uncontrolled emotion here has become an idol. And that's the way we do it. And we, have, we have things that, that we want to protect that are feelings associated with you know, things we love and things we like. And, you know, if someone says anything negative about that, boy, we're going we're gonna to jump, jump on that. We'll jump on them for it. We'll defend it. We'll make sure you don't touch my idol. That's, that's Herodias. And that's what these, uh, these uncontrolled emotions be- become. They become idols in your lives and uh, you, do, you do what you can to nurse that feeling. I imagine Herodias isn't trying to <laughs> trying to get away from the, the angry feeling. I imagine she finds some level of comfort in feeling mad at John. I imagine she feels some level of, of uh, solace and just stewing on this, on this plot to kill John. Um, but uh, you justify revenge, justify payback. This this stuff has to it has to be controlled, and uh, uncontrolled emotions that uh, they'll affect your physical health. I, Proverbs says something about that. He talks about uh, I think bitterness is a rottenness of bones, just destroys people from the inside. Um, uncontrolled emotions. Here's another one. Uncontrolled emotions affect your social reputation. Some people may not want to be around you because you're mad too often. You fly off the handle. Or some people may not want to be around you because you just the, 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 I don't know, maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's excessive crying or maybe it's excessive anger or maybe it's just, it's just some, something that's come up in your life and it's become so, so, so important to you that these relationships are going to suffer because you're just trying to nurse this feeling. So here's, uh, here, well, I'll read you a proverb that goes along with that. The social reputation and the uncontrolled emotions. Here it is. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. <laughs> You know, that, 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 that affects your social situation. When, so, when somebody won't control themselves, other people around them may start backing off a little bit. And that's not other people's fault. That's you. That's what you're doing to other people. So just to, that, that is called giving place to the devil. That's what Paul says. He says, be angry, sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Control it during, I mean, get it, get it under control before you go to bed. And neither give place to the devil. Because if you don't do that, just like a city with the walls broken down and the devil just has free reign. It just, it'll just ruin everything in there. Come in and out however he wants to. All right, so, so back to this, this thought. And when, when John is beheaded... <clears throat> I try to imagine what, uh, what, what, what were the news articles that were published to justify John being killed? I mean, what, what goes out? What's, this, what's the stories that are going to underline? Because you, you read, the people think John is a prophet. And Herod's afraid of the people. And so Herod knows it's not politically expedient to just murder this preacher in prison. So I imagine there has to be some sort of, some sort of uh, campaign, media campaign, at least for the public's sake, so they see John in the similar sight that Herod has to have them see him so they don't, 
think bad of Herod. So I, I don't know. I just I try to think of it all in context of today because this stuff goes on now. People's lives are ruined in the media. People's lives are completely destroyed who haven't done anything. Their lives are completely ruined in the public's eye before they're ruined in reality in prison or something like that. But this stuff goes on. And so, and, w- and it's not a, a justifiable case in the public's eye, then you've got you've to edit some video to make it justifiable. You've got to take some video and edit it to make it justifiable. You've got to take some sound bite and make it justifiable. You know how that stuff works. So Herod, I imagine he's got to go on some, some sort of media campaign to justify this thing. And uh, he says, over in Mark, it says, when it was a convenient day, that's, that's when he did it. Not, not convenient, um, well, convenient to kill John. That's, that's what it was. When it was convenient, he got it done. Um, so here's, here, here's the last point in this. Verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Gave you a lot of information here. I, Try to try to put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Here's John. He's a good man. He's been arrested. He's been beheaded. <laughs> I mean, what a what a what a mess. And I imagine some folks who are following John and following Jesus Christ now wonder. So where are we going with this? Are we all going to end up in prison now? Verse, verse 11 and 12. And his head was brought in a charger, back to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, 11. His head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. <laughs> what, what, a, what a mess. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. This, this is absolutely, it's absolutely terrible what happens to John. And when you, when you consider the reason it happened, it makes it even worse. It just makes it worse. Like, this is, this is why he's killed. This is the reason. And, but it does serve to do one thing, at least in all of this. It should clear up for the disciples and for, for us what God promises in this life and what he doesn't promise in this life. He doesn't promise long life. I mean, not in these bodies anyway. He promises eternal life, but not in these bodies. It it should serve to focus and clear up what's going to happen with the disciples. And uh, when, when John said, you remember when John said, he points to Jesus Christ, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so John is just the forerunner. He points to Jesus Christ. He says, that's, that's, the one, that's the one your nation, your culture, Israel, is built on. That man right there. He's the one. He will take away your sins. And John said, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. But I imagine when he said that, he didn't think this is what was going to happen to decrease. That he would end up in prison on some phony charges, I'm sure, and then end up with his head cut off at 31 years old, and that, was, that would be his life. But uh, it should serve to clear up some expectations. And the reason that's important, and y'all, I, I think y'all understand the reason that's important, unmet expectations or unreasonable expectations, that those, those are the stuff that depression is made of, those are the stuff that uh, um, uh, just, just, what's the word? I, I mean, just, that's, that's the stuff that disappointment is made of. I thought it was going to turn out this way, and it didn't. I thought Jesus was going to come through for me in this, and he just didn't. I mean, if, if you're the disciples carrying away a headless body, from a man who was better than you, you got to be thinking, what am I supposed to expect out of this? And, uh, but it should serve to clear up, look, God isn't promising that I'm, I'm going to live a 
you know, we say, uh, 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 um, uh, he says, life and life more abundantly. Life more abundantly doesn't mean stuff. There, there, is, there is joy that's to be found. And I, I love about the, you guys going out and preaching and, and the opportunity to go out publicly is becoming more and more open. And if you don't know that, it's because you're not doing it. I mean, just it's becoming more and more of an opportunity. But it's it is it is there is joy in that. I'm, I think Alan mentioned something about it in the church. But people are coming to to get tracks. People are asking about the gospel. People are asking about Jesus. People don't don't usually do that. But I think people are scared. They don't know what's going to happen with the country. They don't know what's going to happen with the nation. They don't know what's going to happen with the election. People are just freaked out about stuff. And so, uh, but the point is in, in all of that, there is, whether, whether the politics survives or doesn't survive, there's joy in Jesus Christ. There's peace. There's hope. That's abundant life. That's stuff you can't get at Walmart. You can't go buy this stuff. This is stuff that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. This is, this is stuff that doesn't come from the material things that we acquire. This is stuff that is spiritual. And so the expectation is, the expectation, I, I imagine, again, uh, if you're one of the disciples carrying away this headless body and trying to bury it, you're wondering, what are the expectations in this? What, what should I, I really... What is God's plan here? What, what is the plan? Uh, look over in Romans 8.36. I'll give you one, one verse that describes this. You know what God's plan is? It's Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus Christ to rule and reign on this earth. And when that happens, then things will be made right. But until that happens, you'll have wickedness and periodic intervention with God and things like that. But uh, until that happens, you just deal with the world the way it is. Romans chapter 8, verse, I tell you what, here, here it is. Verse, uh, start in verse, verse 31. He says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's, that was the price. That was God the Father giving up his only begotten Son for the purpose of, for the purpose of offering eternal life freely, offering God's righteousness freely. And so Paul makes, makes a simple statement about it, a question. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Well, there were, there were charges brought up to John the Baptist, but in God's eyes, John was a great man. Maybe not in Herod's eyes or not in the world's eyes, but who cares? Who is he that condemneth? Verse 34. It's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's that's what the world thinks of Jesus Christ. That's what the world thinks of Bible-believing, trying to live holy Christianity. You're just, you're just barbecue. You, you aren't anything more than that. You don't add anything to the culture. You don't add anything to the world. And that's, that's, that's what the world's view of disciples of Jesus Christ is. And he mentions tribulation. He mentions persecution. He mentions famine. And the reason he mentions all that stuff is because Christians go through all that stuff. And when they go through that stuff, they look at God and say, where are you? Where are you? Where, where is this? And just like those disciples, just like John said in prison, when John was in prison, if you remember, he says, he says, are you talking to Jesus Christ? He sends some messengers over to Jesus 
And he says, are you the one or do we look for someone else? Like, this isn't exactly the expectation I had. And so, in all of this, I guess there, there's, there's some, some value to it in this. It, 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 it'll make God's plan a little bit clearer about what the expectations ought to be in this Christian life. I mean, if John, does, he, he deals with this kind of thing, <laughs> this, this, is, this is just par for the course with the world. This is the way the world acts. The, the, the devil has no, no he, do, he doesn't care. I mean, he doesn't care that John is a preacher. He doesn't care. I mean, the only thing he cares about is shutting up the preacher. Really, that's the only thing he cares about. So it, it ought to correct your expectations in, in this. Here's, here's this whole disastrous decision to kill John the Baptist. Herod is, I mean, he's just a political guy, uh, comes from a political family. He commits adultery with Herodias. The preacher calls him out for it. He gets mad. She gets mad, really. And uh, John ends up with his head chopped off because the wife of some political figure got mad. And the Lord says, well, that's kind of what happens in this world. I, I mean, I, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I will admit, I mean, it, it, is, it is easy to read this and say what I'm saying right here in this environment. When, when, when the police or if the police ever start knocking on doors or not to scare you or whatever, just understand the world is hostile to Jesus Christ. Conformity to the world is not how you win the world. The world is hostile to Jesus Christ, and they're always going to be hostile. Whether it's um, subtle or whether it's overt hostility, the world's hostile to Jesus Christ. So there's some expectations that maybe can be cleared up. Here's God's plan, and here's not God's plan. God's plan isn't that you're going to live healthy and rich your whole life. That's, that's not God's plan. Not in this life anyway. Not in this life anyway. But let's pray. We'll get out of here. Father... I pray it's been helpful. Um, we all, we all want to live healthy and rich, um, but to set that as our expectations on you, Lord, that, that's another story. Um, I pray that you would help us with these verses, help us make the applications that need to be made, and uh, Lord, thank you for your words. We're, we're just not not deserving of these words at all, but you've graciously given us your words. And uh, thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. And uh, I do lift up Nancy and Barry who are feeling bad this morning. I pray you'd heal them up and give them grace um, as they feel bad and all the conditions they got going on there. I pray that you'd help them. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.